Good morning, and welcome to everyone joining us today. As, as Chairman Stif Smith, Staff Director the, at the Helsinki Commission, I'll make a brief statement, and uh, then Bob Hand, our Staff Advisor at the Commission, will, will, will introduce our witnesses. Our briefing today will be on the May 8th local elections in Albania, on their conduct, results, and consequences for that country and the Western Balkans. The Helsinki Commission has monitored and, ad and advocated for human rights and democracy in Albania for over two decades. Chairman Smith has chaired two hearings on democratic development, human rights, and the rule of law in that country, most recently in 2004, and over the years has met with Albanian officials to discuss these and related topics such as trafficking in persons. In many areas, Albania has made significant progress, as in democratic development, and certainly the lives of Albanians have improved tremendously in the last 20 years. Yet elections remain for Albania a source of tension and, and instability. The country is politically polarized, extraordinarily so, and it seems that many on both sides of the divide have little real respect for the electoral system. The operative criteria for judging an election or, or an electoral system appears to be whether it allows them to win. Otherwise, many seem to believe it must be illegitimate. Sadly, since the 2009 parliamentary elections, the country has been at a political impasse. In January of this year, political protests became violent. We hoped, and we still hope, that the May 8 local elections will put Albania on the right path, focusing on the needs of, of the citizens. While our panelists can elaborate, the general sense seems to be that the balloting went reasonably well. It is the counting of ballots uh, uh, where problems have come up as has often been the case in post-communist Albania, especially in the very close race for, for the mayor of the capital city, Tirana. Now I'll turn the hearing over to Bob Hand, who's for over 20 years uh, monitored and advocated for human rights in the Western Balkans, and he will moderate our briefing. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, and I'd like to uh, welcome everybody uh, uh, here in the audience uh, to this briefing this morning. A uh, particular welcome to uh, those who are with the South Central Europe class at the Foreign Service Institute that uh, Janusz Bugajski uh, teaches. Um, gives you a sense of what we do here on the Hill. Um, and uh, I'll probably uh, be reciprocating at some point, coming out to your embassies and having you guys as control officers uh, for my visit, just to see what you're doing uh, out there. Um, we have three panelists this morning uh, to discuss uh, the situation in Albania um, today. Our first panelist is uh, Jonathan Stone Street, who has been the head of the OSCE election observation mission uh, for the May 8th local elections in uh, Albania. Um, he led a sizable deployment of both long-term observers and short-term observers. And I think the size of the, the deployment was actually indicative of how uh, serious the international community was in wanting to have these elections uh, uh, turn out well. Um, they were able to put people out there to, to help encourage that. Uh, Mr. Stone Street will elaborate on the OSCE's findings and continuing concerns as the process of appeals uh, lingers on. Um, he joins us electronically uh, via telephone from uh, Paris. Um, we had actually tried to get him here physically um, but was unable to, uh, to make that happen. And uh, we had some very strong efforts by our uh, embassy in Paris, where uh, Jonathan is now, uh, try to, uh, to get him here so we could see him as well as hear him. Uh, but that unfortunately didn't uh, work out. But uh, as our final backup, we have him um, on uh, the telephone and he will make uh, a presentation, and it's his words that count more than uh, anything. But I want to uh, thank you in particular, Jonathan, for your um, patience as we've gone through this whole process. I think it shows how uh, important you think these elections were, um, that you've uh, agreed to participate no matter which way uh, we were able to, uh, to get your um, presentation here in Washington. Uh, our second panelist is uh, Robert Benjamin of the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs, or NDI. NDI has had a very long presence in, uh, in Albania, and I'll let uh, 
Rob uh, speak a little bit more detail about that. Um, but Rob himself has focused on the countries of uh, Central and Eastern Europe for quite uh, a long period of time, participated in numerous uh, previous commission briefings, and is a real expert uh, on each one of the countries that uh, NDI follows. And so I am very glad that that he is here this morning, and he will talk about what he has heard about the, the May 8th local elections as well, um, but then uh, maybe uh, go a little bit more broadly and discuss uh, the overall trends of democratic development uh, in, uh, in Albania. Our final uh, panelist um, is uh, Janusz Bugajski from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. Um, who is another very long-term uh, follower of uh, events in Albania. Um, I think it was about 20 years ago where we bumped into each other in the streets of Tirana observing uh, their first multi-party um, elections. Um, and I know that you've been back there uh, many times since, uh, Janusz. Um, Albania is a NATO ally. It's aspiring to join the... European Union, and it's also located in the Western Balkans, where recovery from the conflicts of 10 to 20 years ago um, has been steady, but it's been by no means complete. There are still some uh, problems in the region. And uh, with regional stability uh, not yet consolidated, it's important to look at Albania and its place in the region, um, its aspirations for European integration and, uh, and to see the direction in which it's uh, going in an even broader context. Uh, so we will have, uh, have Janusz as our final uh, panelist. So let me start with uh, you, Jonathan. I hope you can hear us okay. Yeah, that's fine. I hope you can hear me. Yep, uh, I think it sounds, uh, sounds perfect. You're very clear. If you can't hear anything, just... Uh, um, intervene and say, you know, could you please repeat that, uh, when, especially when we come to the question period. Uh, it's okay with you if we have the presentation from all three panelists and then go to questions? Sure, that's fine. And if I get cut off at some point, just, uh, just give me a call back. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, go all ahead. Right. The floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, and uh, thanks to the uh, uh, U.S. Helsinki Commission for the opportunity to participate in this briefing and to offer the perspectives of the OSCE ODIHR election observation mission. Um, to provide some context for our mission, the, the ODIR received an early invitation from the Foreign Ministry of Albania uh, shortly after the elections were called last year, uh, and then there was a needs assessment uh, mission, uh, and then uh, following that, the ODIR decided to send a full election observation mission. Uh, we started at the end of March. Uh, we had 16 members in our core team and 24 long-term observers deployed throughout the country. And then we were joined just before Election Day by some 250 short-term uh, observers, as well as uh, by a delegation from the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities of the Council of Europe, and uh, with whom we, we enjoyed excellent cooperation. Um, the decision to deploy a full observation mission for local elections is uh, something that the ODIR is not often uh, able to do. Uh, and as Bob said, it, it reflects both the uh, importance of Albania's democratization process for the OSCE and its participating states, uh, as well as the critical moment in that process in which Albania found itself at the time and, and uh, in which it still finds itself. Uh, and, of course, the focus right now is uh, on the election for the mayor of Tirana, and that's normal given the political significance of that race and the extraordinary closeness of the margin. Um, but it is an anomalous situation, a few hundred votes difference either way, and the discussion we would be having now regarding elections in Albania would be, would be very diff uh, different, I think. And so that we don't lose the opportunity today to discuss the broader conduct of the local elections, I would like to step back and consider where we were just under three weeks ago, uh, about May 13th, just before the finalization of counting in all of the ball ballot counting centers. And at that moment, counting had already finished for most municipalities and communes. Uh, there were 384 of those. Um, and it had not gone perfectly. Uh, in some places, the counting was painfully slow or it was delayed for unexplained reasons, and there were procedural problems in other places. Yet the process was going. Um, 
uh, parties and observers were closely following the counting. Results were being reached. Uh, the protocols were being signed, and some of the losing candidates were graciously congratulating their opponents. So in other words, in spite of the the bitter and real political divisions in Albania, heightened since the 2009 elections and reaching a crisis point on 21 January of this year, uh, at that moment the local elections, and for all their flaws, would have been seen as bridging some of these divisions and, and allowing the country uh, to, to move forward. And the focus would probably, uh, in that case, now be uh, not on the validity of ballots, but on Euro Albania's European integration process and on how to resolve remaining challenges in advance of future elections. Um, the ODIR election observation mission uh, issued a preliminary statement of findings and conclusions two days after Election Day, uh, in which we identified the issues um, uh, that uh, both the, the challenges and, and the, the, the positive aspects that lay the groundwork for future progress. And I, I don't think it's necessary to cover all of those issues here, uh, but I would like to mention some of the main points. Um, on the positive side, the, the elections were competitive, uh, and the large number of registered parties and candidates gave voters a, a wide choice. Uh, parties were generally able to campaign freely, uh, and abuse of administrative resources uh, appeared to be significantly reduced from previous elections. The media offered a plurality of views and allowed voters to make an informed choice. Uh, although broadcast media are not truly independent of political parties, uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the information was uh, out there for, for people who wanted to find it. Um, the Central Election Commission completed the technical preparations for the elections in an overall transparent manner, despite some problems that I'll, I'll come back to in a minute. Um, efforts uh, were undertaken since 2009 to improve the voters' lists, uh, for example, by reducing the number of duplicate uh, entries in the lists. And the Electoral College acted in a professional and unbiased manner in the pre-election day period and provided a corrective uh, for some of the decisions of the Central Election Commission. Our uh, prelim preliminary statement also identified uh, a number of issues that will need to be addressed uh, in the future in order for elections in Albania to be assessed as meeting OSCE commitments for democratic elections. And some of these issues persist from previous elections, and some derive directly from the existing high polarization that Bob mentioned uh, and the mistrust between parties and government and, and opposition. Uh, and the first uh, of these uh, elements I would like to comment on are that the, the two main political parties, uh, the Democratic Party and the Socialist Party, did not discharge their electoral duties in a responsible manner. And this negatively affected the administration of the process and undermined public confidence in elections. And this was apparent in the use of uh, uh, the Central Election Commission as a political battleground between the parties, uh, also in the late nomination of lower-level Election Commission members, and uh, in irresponsible public accusations which questioned the integrity of election commissioners at all levels. And I think here I should emphasize that I'm speaking about uh, both the, uh, the two main parties, both the Democratic Party and the Socialist Party, uh, because each of those parties, uh, when I met with them, tended to uh, say that such uh, assessments were, were, were directed at, at their opponent and not at, not at themselves. Um, it, uh, the work of the election administration um, uh, was also hampered uh, in the initial phases of the process by the boycott of the opposition-nominated CEC members and by the late nomination of lower-level election commission members by the Socialist Party. Um, after the CEC began meeting in its full composition about one month prior to Election Day, its discussions were often acrimonious and, and political. Um, decisions on issues disputed by the two main parties were, were taken on partisan lines rather than uh, collegially. Uh, so that means that when, when there was no disagreement between the, the two main parties, they acted as a collegial body, but the, the moment that the parties had different views, uh, there was a clear division in, inside the Central Election Commission. Um, and this perception of, perception of partisanship did not build uh, trust in the Central Election Commission as an institution. 
I think it's also important to to add as a side note here that this high polarization of the election process did not necessarily extend to lower level commissions. Uh, and from uh, our long term observers reported that uh, for the most part these uh, worked uh, uh, collegially. Uh, the campaign. Uh, I noted the positive aspects previously, but uh, it was also marred by at least three dozen violent incidents directly related to the elections. These ranged from brawls among supporters of different parties to much more serious uh, crimes, such as shootings and the use of uh, explosive devices. Uh, in addition, there were a number of cases of pressure on public employees and others in the campaign period, uh, particularly to support the Democratic Party. Uh, the Electoral Code, uh, despite being an overall adequate basis for the conduct of elections, contains some gaps and ambiguities, and particularly in relation to local elections. And then the final uh, uh, comment on that, on, uh, sort of on the negative side, uh, I would say would be that although Election Day went relatively well, there were a number of problems in, hearing, in adhering to procedures that are designed to provide safeguards in the voting process. For example, the application and checking of ink on voters' fingers. Uh, in addition, family or and proxy voting was observed in over 25% uh, of the polling stations uh, where we observed. So those are some of the issues which should be addressed by the authorities and the political parties in the future and for which the recommendations in the ODR final report will attempt to provide some potential solutions. <clears throat> and this brings us back to what's happened since... Uh, 14 May, which was the end of the counting of ballots for the Tirana mayoral race in the ballot counting centers, uh, when the pre preliminary results showed a 10-vote difference between the two main candidates out of some 250,000 ballots cast. And an election result that close can put the strongest of election administration structures uh, to the test. And uh, I think that... Uh, uh, what we've seen in, in Albania is that, the, the, that we, we don't have the strongest uh, uh, election administration um, in, in place, uh, so that, that that kind of pressure uh, is, is even, even, even greater. Uh, our mission issued a post-election interim report in which the mission factually reported on the counting process uh, on the dispute regarding ballots cast in the wrong ballot boxes in Tirana and on the Central Election Commission's controversial counting of miscast ballots. Our mission exercised a, a maximum amount of discretion in characterizing uh, the, the Central Election Commission's actions, um, especially given that there are appeals lodged with the Electoral College, which are still pending. However, um, we, we could not fail to note that the Central Election Commission took actions which had far-reaching implications uh, on a non-collegial basis uh, without taking a, a decision that would authorize or explain those actions until after uh, they had concluded. So I don't want to comment further at this point uh, because these questions, as I said, are for the Electoral College to resolve. But certainly the Central Election Commission's actions and the appeals process are, are issues that the ODR mission continues to examine and will, and will uh, reach conclusions about in, in its final report. Uh, finally, I, I would like to highlight one more positive aspect of these elections, uh, that of uh, the role of nonpartisan domestic observers who played a very active role in monitoring the elections, and I very much hope that their conclusions and their recommendations uh, will also be taken into account in, in discussions of uh, potential improvement. So I would conclude uh, there, and then um, uh, after the other presentations, I'll, I'll be open to, to any questions. But I, I thank you once again uh, for the uh, opportunity to, to speak today. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. We'll now go to uh, Rob Benjamin from uh, NDI. Rob? No reds. It's pretty hard to see the light. Is it on? No. Just shout, folks. Uh, Bob, I don't have any sound, by the way. 
Uh, we, we were trying to work some uh, some uh, microphones uh, okay. here, so uh, okay. it's coming through right now. All right. Is it okay to proceed without a microphone? Um, can you I think you have one. Uh, I don't, no. No. Okay. Uh, I think the microphone's on now. Thank you, Bob, and uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Robert Benjamin with the National Democratic Institute, and I'm very pleased to join you this morning to discuss Albania's local elections. Uh, as Bob uh, suggested at the outset, uh, the National Democratic Institute, NDI, supported Albania's democratic transition now for quite a few years, since 1991, actually, uh, through political party development, uh, citizen participation in uh, local politics and community advocacy, and uh, I'm happy to say nonpartisan election monitoring dating back to the 1990s. Uh, with funding uh, at present from the National Endowment for Democracy and the NED, NDI is presently supporting women's political participation following on the many years of, uh, of Institute support to really what amounts to hundreds of political figures and civic activists and government officials in Tirana and throughout the country as they are building a participatory, accountable and participatory uh, 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 and transparent, excuse me, political system. NDI's perspective on this election cycle, therefore, is, is shaped by our longstanding presence in Albania, as Bob had mentioned, and the relationships that we enjoy across its political spectrum. Our engagement in recent months uh, with a, a variety of political and civic leaders in Tirana and around the country, and by our institutional experience in supporting democratic elections worldwide. These elections and Albania's uh, democratic transition overall must be considered in the context of comprehensive political, social, and economic change uh, as the country transforms itself in roughly the span of one generation. Uh, from communist isolation to an open democracy and a market economy. And ultimately, uh, it is to the citizens of Albania to determine if this election process merits their confidence as a democratic exercise in the broader context of the country's transition. Albania entered this election cycle in a highly polarized environment, as has been said. Uh, stemming from controversy uh, from the, the last election cycle, the parliamentary elections in 2009, grounded in uh, deep-seated uh, uh, and highly personalized conflict between Albania's political parties and punctuated by the political violence this past January that tragically led to several deaths and many injuries. This particular event unambiguously called upon political leaders in Albania to step back from their partisan brinksmanship to prevent an escalation of conflict in advance of the local elections. And by and large, these calls have been heeded. Albania proceeded to the May 8th local elections in a relatively calm environment. And while attempts at multi-partisan election uh, reform coming out of the 2009 cycle failed, uh, a concerted, if not always consensus-based effort to make electoral procedures more transparent was launched with the vocal encouragement of representatives of the international community. NDI reports in the pre-election period noted shortcomings in election administration and campaign conduct of the kind that Jonathan relayed, including sporadic and localized episodes of violence. Shortcomings, I'll add, that are consistent with deficiencies uh, in election cycles observed in neighboring countries. Election day itself came and went, and particular advancements were evident. As Jonathan said, in the increased profile of nonpartisan citizen observers, public dialogue around concrete policy reform issues, the use of social media to expand voter outreach, and the growing, if uneven, presence of women standing for local office, including an unexpected victory f uh, for a female candidate for the mayor of the city of Burel. On the whole, the peaceful conduct of the elections was testament to Albania's desire to move away from the recent volatile past and closer to its destined rendezvous with the rest of Europe and the broader transatlantic community as a fully democratic country. Indeed, were it not for the contentious situation over the outcome of the key race for mayor of Tirana, in which uh, either main candidate has led by an extremely thin margin of double-digit votes amidst decisions uh, by electoral authorities that raise questions of legal and procedural and possibly political natures. 
Uh, were it not for this case, this gathering would, as Jonathan suggested, emphasize these elections as an unfettered opportunity to reinvigorate democratic reform through political moderation and through cross-party dialogue. The opportunity to set the country back on a democratic path is indeed there, and the need to seize it is imperative. But to get to it, Albania's governing bodies and its political establishment need to resolve the outcome of the Tirana mayoral race in a way that engenders public confidence in their shared readiness to work together to advance the country's interests. This is arguably more important for Albania than who comes to occupy the mayor's office in Tirana. After all, the, election, the overall election results and the Tirana mayor's race to an exquisite degree show the electorate to support both major political options on basically equal footing. Both sides received a mandate in these elections. Neither should therefore resort to one-sided triumphalism or prolonged protest. Much has been said of the procedural, legal, and political factors that have brought about the extraordinary, if not unprecedented, situation in Tirana. And as Albania's Electoral College deliberates on these complexities, and as Jonathan noted, it would be inappropriate to review here the basis of the appeals before it. But it is fitting, and perhaps timely, to note prior instances in which election results were too close to produce a clear victor and or the outcome uh, was highly contested such as the U.S. presidential election in 2000, Germany's federal elections in 2005, and Mexico's presidential elections in 2006. Each of these instances is singular, and strict comparisons among them are ill-advised. Still, on a general level, they offer a basic principle. The degree to which government officials charged with applying the law to determine an outcome amidst a disputed process, the degree to which they acquit their legal powers neutrally and transparently, and the degree to which political leaders show maturity and restraint in their comportment, those two factors ultimately determine how a country moves on, moves on from an election that in many respects is democratic, but which by dint of voter intent, and at least in the U.S. case, procedural imprecision, produces a contestable outcome whose ultimate arbitration many find hard to accept. So in light of the above, and with a view to seizing the opportunity to restore democratic reform and progress in the wake of these elections, Albania's main political parties have the obligation to end the political stalemate that they have locked the country into for the last couple of years. Failure to do so will hold Albania back from European integration and retard its democracy. Ending the political stalemate following the local ele elections encompasses many actions. The following are essential, but by no means exhaustive. First, a multipartisan commitment to commence election reform in Parliament, to close procedural gaps, and to continue the process of improving election standards prior to the 2012 parliamentary elections. That's imperative. This process must be made public and include voices outside of the main parties to ensure that reforms agreed to incorporate the interests of a broad section of Albanian society. Second, parties should take every step to ensure the public that they are not unduly influencing legal or procedural actions of bodies overseeing elections, from local polling commissions to the Central Election Commission. Parties should leave the representatives whom they have appointed to do what's right by these bodies and the Albanian public. Political opportunism has no place in a democratic election, particularly in this current environment, an environment in which extraordinary steps are needed to demonstrate and reinforce impartiality. Third, the mayor of Toronto, once invested in City Hall, should take demonstrative steps to govern inclusively to reflect that both major political options are part of the city's governing structure. And finally, at a very fundamental level, Sustained and substantive inter-party dialogue in Parliament and city councils around the country must replace partisan invective and recrimination. Any political system to be democratic cannot be the reserve of few, but must be the domain of all. It is to Albania's governing bodies, with the help of international groups as might be sought, to resolve the issue of the election of the mayor of Tirana, and to do so in a manner that is transparent, impartial, and as resolute as the law under which they are working allows. Uh, it's to Albania's political parties 
and elected representatives to remedy the shortcomings observed in this election cycle and to do so in a way that meaningfully incorporates other voices in the process. And correspondingly, the Albanian public cannot defer to the political establishment by giving in to the apathy and resentment that so many have expressed to my NDI colleagues in, in Tirana. Instead, citizens need to be organized so as to monitor, advocate, and otherwise insert themselves into public affairs, for it is they, not the political leadership, who are the ultimate guarantors of Albania's democracy. No election, no matter how democratic, is perfect. And at the same time, no election, given its imperfections, can be considered democratic if citizens do not have confidence in the process. And sometimes, and perhaps now, public confidence is tested by close and disputed outcomes, as is the case in Tirana. Indeed, presumably not everyone will be assuaged by the process that ultimately produces Tirana's next mayor. That's why Albania's political leaders have the obligation to demonstrate political moderation, dialogue, inclusion, compromise, and diversity, so that no matter the outcome of this race, Albania can move forward as it must. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. Uh, are you still with us, Jonathan? You can hear us okay? Yeah, I'm still here. Thanks. Okay, good. Well, then we will now turn to uh, Janusz Bogajski from uh, CSIS. Janusz? Okay, thank you, Bob. Is this it is? Okay. Not very bright. Okay. All right, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, 20 years since we met in Tehran. I hope we're not still sitting here in 20 years' time debating Albania's progress and encouraging it. Um, hopefully this would be one of the last times, but I tend to doubt it. Anyway, I'm going to try and be brief and to the point, and I apologize if I repeat anything that's already been said, but, but the points that have been made that I do emphasize are clearly worth underscoring. Let me begin by saying this, that I think Albania suffers from at least six uh, interrelated disorders that obstruct its political, economic, and international development and can precipitate a spiral of destabilizing national conflict. Let me begin with point one, political bipolarism, or the bipolar disorder. Albania has developed, it's not the only country in the region, but one where it's clearly having a major negative impact. Albania has developed a bifurcated two-party system, despite numerous attempts by individuals within both the socialist and democratic parties over the past two decades to try and break the deadlock and to form electorally viable and durable new third parties. Political life is highly personalized and has been directed by strong leaders where top-down management places limits on intra-party political competition uh, and the input of citizens in decision-making. I think the latest round of conflict is actually symptomatic of this fundamental reality. Secondly, and again related to this, limited political competitions. These attempts to form durable and electable third parties have proven difficult, especially when there are splinters from the two major formations whose leaders seek to discourage fractionalization. The, the, the socialists, and uh, although several do exist and some have persisted through several election cycles, the democratic and socialist parties together always control the majority, overwhelming majority of parliamentary seats. And it suits the two mega parties to have a larger number of smaller formations. Is that a buzzer for me? No, okay. Uh, in Parliament, rather than the single third force, which could become the kingmaker and draw them into electoral coalitions. After each round of parliamentary elections, some smaller parties have been brought into coalitions, but this does not threaten the major two-party monopoly and does not contribute sufficiently to developing novel political programs and fostering political competition. Third point related, non-ideological conflict. Albania's underlying political disputes are not based on party ideologies or programs, as the two major formations largely share the same goals. Left, center, and right are progr programmatically almost meaningless, I would say, in Albania. Not just in Albania, in much of the region. Instead, party divisions have become grounded in group loyalties and leadership support concretized into two mutually exclusive political camps. Four, political clientelism. This has developed over the past 20 years, similarly to other Balkan countries, and involves an extensive patronage network, a spoiled system of official appointments, favoritism shown to supporters of the governing party, and various levels of state party corruption. 
Clientelism is now deeply ingrained in the political structure, and of course not only in Albania, as we see amongst Albania's neighbors. It undermines, as I've already mentioned, political competition based on program and merit. It also means that political office is lucrative, and losing office is financially painful and is therefore resisted. Fifth point, zero-sum political culture. Each election is supposed to create clear winners and losers, and when the result is extremely close, as we see in the recent mayoral elections in Tirana, even where the uh, election process is clearly improved, by all accounts, there is little tradition or willingness to engage in dialogue and compromise. Instead, there is always a danger that disputes will escalate into open conflict. This is not just a question of hanging chads, but of different interpretations and uses of the electoral law. Six, political revenge factor. Politics in Albania also contains the principle that you contested my election victory, so I will contest yours even more vigorously. And such contests are not simply conducted through legal means. As a result, we have witnessed regular parliamentary boycotts, constant complaints to international institutions, persistent public protests against election results, and even instances of vandalism and violence often intended to provoke a government overreaction. So those are the six points. Let me continue. The disputed Tirana mayoral elections and the ongoing battle of the ballots has compounded the existing grievances from the 2009 parliamentary elections and threatens to transform political polarization and legislative gridlock into outright civil conflict. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but there is that danger. The only solution, however difficult, in an overheated political environment is a legal ruling that the final election result, whether for the Democrat or Socialist candidate, meets constitutional and international standards. And this may require high-level international involvement of EU and US representatives to defuse the crisis before rather than after the conflict escalates. As a result of the factors I have outlined, the ongoing standoff over to the 2009 general elections, as well as the recent mayoral elections, have become dangerous opportunities for confrontation and escalation. Meanwhile, necessary reforms to meet EU accession criteria have stalled, and the passage of legislation is often blocked. Long-term paralysis will simply increase social frustration, raise the risk of economic decline, and further erode Albania's qualifications for the European Union. It is often said that once a country accedes to NATO or the European Union, the Allies have very few policy instruments available to positively influence its behavior. This is not fully accurate, I believe, in the case of Albanian-US relations because of the high esteem in which the US is held in Albania by all political formations. Washington possesses both direct and indirect instruments to help Tirana make the right decisions in its own national interests. It needs to assist Albania in constructing a more competitive political system, in developing a politically more active younger generation, in continuing to improve the conduct of elections, in reforming key institutions such as the judiciary, in encouraging greater media nonpartisanship, and in various other ways qualifying politically for inclusion in the EU and, and thereby becoming a more effective partner for the United States. And this is my last area because Bob asked me to talk about the regional significance. Uh, the US can also promote Albania's strategic interests by helping to resolve the pan-national question so that Tirana is not drawn into potentially damaging disputes with its neighbors and remains a constructive political player in the Balkans, which it has been for the past 20 years. A potentially negative scenario may unfold in the region if a confluence of factors coalesce in the coming years. And this, this, these are more likely to embroil an unstable Albania with limited European prospects than a politically stable Albania en route to the European Union. Such factors may include growing social unrest in, in Kosovo as a consequence of international isolation and economic distress that encourages uh, certain populist elements to mushroom in, in, uh, in Pristina. Uh, <coughs> the potential division of Kosovo through attempts at unilateral partition supported by Belgrade a de facto fracturing of Bosnia-Herzegovina and its drift towards conflict that encourages other regional secessions, and political conflicts in the Republic of Macedonia that begins to assume ethnic dimensions 
with Albanian parties calling for federalization or even separation instead of a share of the political office, as Skopje's progress towards the EU is also stalled. Now, this is the complex puzzle that cannot be resolved, obviously, by the US or the European Union acting alone. It will require a much more determined drive by the EU with US political assistance to incorporate the West Balkan states, beginning as soon as possible with Croatia, uh, which has uh, closed 30, I believe, of 35 chapters of the European Union requirements and is due for membership by 2012, although we're not sure, particularly with the mood in the EU at the moment on further enlargement, exactly whether that's going to be ratified by all parliaments and how quickly. Uh, Croatia's membership as soon as possible, accompanied by clear membership tracks for all other states. It also necessitates more significant involvement in institutional stabilization, as we've already discussed. Unfortunately, this is clearly not popular in the EU itself, where leaders and taxpayers are wary of bringing in new problems into the, into the Union. Short of such commitments, political and economic prospects in the West Balkan region are likely to diminish and spur out migration. Disillusionment with the EU will increase, and the Union's effectiveness and viability will come under increasing question. Such scenarios could also undermine reformist leaders and bring more populist and nationalist elements to the forefront who will benefit from economic distress and brewing public an anger and may trumpet ethnicity and xenophobia as solutions to mounting domestic challenges. In this context, if Albania were to descend from prolonged political conflict to social unrest and state instability, this will only have negative consequences or feed into the negative consequences for the wider region. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Janusz. We'll now move to uh, the um, next phase of our uh, briefing, which is to open it up to the wider participation of the audience, um, primarily for a question to one or all of our panelists. Uh, I may tolerate a very brief comment or two, uh, especially from some people in the audience who I know uh, actually are deserving of being up here on a panel. Um, and, but I'd like to start by first uh, acknowledging the presence of the uh, ambassador of Albania, uh, Gilbert Galanchi. And I would like to give him the courtesy, as is the commission tradition, um, if, he, if he would like to, to come to the podium, if he would like to make a very brief comment, um, and also if he would like to ask a question as the ambassador of the country uh, concerned here today. Ambassador? Thank you for giving me the possibility to, to address the audience and uh, to have a discussion with you. And I want to thank uh, Jonathan Stone Street for being with us today. I'm glad to listen to different opinions and concerns, which make me strongly believe that Albania has good and sincere friends who are impatient, I may say, to see my country as equal amongst equals in the community of democracies, concretely speaking, into the EU. I also wish to stress the fact that uh, OSCE or DIR has not its in mandate to observe local elections. But since my government put a lot of stress and importance to these elections, although they were local elections, I personally, because I was ambassador to OSCE, invited officially or DIR to observe these elections in Albania, which shows that the Albanian government was much more interested in the process, in complying with the standards of OSCE and with the democratic uh, standards, rather than in having the result, who is going to take the seat of the mayor of Tirana or Duras or whatever. I wish briefly to make only a few comments on these elections. I must say that these elections uh, were free and fair, and we witnessed a very high turnout of the voters. Officially, it is 50%, but unofficially, I guess it's 75%, because myself, my staff, although they were in the list, they couldn't vote because we were here. With this, I want to touch the issue that we recognize the immediate need to address the electoral code, because we know it needs improvements. There have been 32 recommendations from the 2009 elections made by Odier, which were never addressed. 
because the parliament didn't function properly. So we are all aware that there are holes and bumps in the electoral code, but this is what we have, and we had the elections. The next issue I wish to stress is that these elections proved to be very, very transparent. I think the most transparent elections in the world, because I don't know any other case when every single vote is shown to the scanner, to the big screen, to the camera. So practically, I could count the votes from Washington, D.C., watching different TV stations. I think it's a constitutional obligation of my government to guarantee the right of vote to every single citizen of Albania, be it in Albania or be it in the D.C. I couldn't go to vote, but those who could, they could vote. I think my government met this obligation. And here we come to the fundamental concept of democracy. I think no need to explain the Greek term democracy. So I think in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it is rightly written, I quote, the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of the government. This will shall be expressed in periodic and genuine elections, which shall be by universal and equal suffrage and shall be held by secret vote or by equivalent, equivalent free voting procedures. I think this is quite clear, and this is what is happening right now in my country, where every single vote is being counted. So because the, the Central Electoral Commission is counting the valid votes and the invalid votes, as well as the contested votes. And I again stress that this is a very transparent process shown to the camera every single vote. I think that what we experienced in the last days was quite unfortunate because Albania is a functioning democracy. We have all the institutional capacities, institutional bodies to solve and resolve every issue. In the first place, we have the Electoral Commission, which is doing its work under a lot of pressure, street pressure, verbal pressure, political pressure, and we should let them work. They take a decision, be it wrong or right, okay? This is the Central Electoral Commission elected by consensus in 2008. Then we have a perfect system, I think, of checks and balances because every decision which is taken by the Central Electoral Commission is, juridically speaking, an interim decision because every decision can be attacked and appealed in the Electoral College, which is the Supreme Court for elections in Albania. You have to know that the Electoral College is elected uh, periodically, and seven members of the Electoral College have been elected or appointed during the socialist administrations, and one member is elected during the Democrats' administration. <coughs> but the interesting fact is that every judging body for every single case or appeal in this electoral process is done by casting lots. So you never know who's going to judge the case. Okay? And I think that we have the system. So all that we request is the international assistant to solve this problem legally, in a legal way as it has happened in many states, in many countries, and not in the streets. We have to say stop to the street solutions once and forever, because the elections were not bad. I think the U.S. State Department has stated that they were the best ever held in Albania, and this is true, I fully uh, agree with that. But we have to stick to the legal solutions, to the legal procedures. This is all we ask for, because it's, it's quite normal that an aspiring EU country should stick to the rules of the game and not have political solutions in the streets. This is not acceptable, dear friends, anymore. I wish to thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Am Ambassador. Um, I would then like to uh, call on uh, Mark, uh, Mark Milos, um, Chief of Staff at the Helsinki Commission, uh, give him the opportunity to ask uh, the first question of uh, the panelists. Or I assume if anybody has questions for the ambassador as well, that uh, the ambassador might be able to answer either at the podium or afterwards um, um, at some point. So, Mark? Here. Thanks, Bob. And um, thanks for everyone who joined us today.
Thanks, Bob, for doing such a great job moderating. Uh, I, I'd, I'd like to ask about the voters' expectations and, and, and uh, demands. Uh, I, I think there are two ways people can, can react to a battle of the ballots or shenanigans in, in, in votes or, or difficulties and uncertainties in counting. One, people can, can uh, demand um, and, ex and expect more fairness and justice. Or two, people can, people can become more cynical and, and, and react by becoming concerned only with, well, whatever the outcome, uh, the only thing that matters is that, that we win, that, 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 that my party win. And this is certainly not a comment on Albania. We, 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 see, we see both, both reactions uh, in, in, in the United States and in, 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 in every country. Uh, but I, I'd, I'd like to ask the, the, the panelists, what, what do they see in, in, in Albania? Uh, what, 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 what comments would, would they have on, 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 on this way of uh, the, the, um, the, the, the choices, you know, how, how people re react to the difficulties with, with the elections? Are they becoming more cynical? Are certain groups or parties becoming more cynical, or is, is, is there is there a growing demand and expectation uh, that the, the 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 elections be administered uh, fairly? Uh, second, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on on uh, on, on why uh, you think things are happening the way they are. And uh, thirdly, uh, this is related. Uh, I'd be interested to hear any thoughts on how Albanians see elections in, in other countries. For example, if, 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 uh, if uh, there's a large number of people in the country, uh, perhaps a quarter, a half, maybe, maybe 10 percent, who, who, who tend to see, you know, however many, who, who, who tend to see elections in, in, in neighboring countries, um, say Italy, Serbia, as, as uh, no different than their own, then, then it becomes more difficult to, uh, to raise the demand or expectation for, for more, more fair and just elections. So um, maybe Mr. Stone Street could start. Jonathan? Yes, uh, well, um, thanks for the questions. Um, I, I'm not sure that I'm the best place to, to talk about how Albanians uh, uh, perceive the elections. Um, but uh, perhaps I could go back uh, um, uh, to what Janusz was uh, saying about uh, uh, political clientelism, he, he, he termed it. Um, and uh, I think that there's, uh, uh, perhaps the answer is, is there. Um, that is that a lot of people have, uh, are very much, uh, at least from the information that, that I had, uh, which, which corresponded with what Janusz said, um, that, that people have very direct economic links uh, to who, uh, who is in power, even at the, the, the local level, much less at, at national level. Um, so, you know, I think that, that people probably in general would, would like to, to know that, that justice is being done, that uh, the law is being respected. Uh, at the same time, there's, uh, there's a lot of... Uh, of um, uh, uh, There's a lot of pressure, uh, and, and sometimes that pressure is exercised on people directly, but sometimes it's just there uh, um, sort of hanging in the air because people's jobs uh, are uh, dependent on, on who is in power. Um, that, that may have some of the uh, – I don't know if that helps answer uh, the, the question at all, but perhaps uh, the other panelists will, will have a, a clear response. Thank you, Jonathan. And before going to the other uh, panelists, I think because we can't see you, we'll always try to call on you first for the general questions, just in case you do want to speak. Um, I can see the other uh, panelists and whether they're signaling to, uh, to speak or not. And uh, actually, uh, Rob Benjamin is now. So, Rob? Okay. Thank you, Bob. Uh, and thanks for these, uh, these, I think, trenchant questions. I think they go, in many respects, to the heart of the matter. This election cycle did uh, see uh, exhibitions of, of, of participation. Uh, people did get involved, not least of which through uh, a more robust uh, monitoring by citizens who were trained observers in polling stations. I think that's commendable. Uh, the women uh, that NDI supports currently throughout the political parties 
uh, wanted to stand as candidates and made the best of opportunities that were afforded them. Opportunities, by the way, that are hard to win uh, for, for women uh, in, in not only Albania's political life, but in, uh, in, in, in other uh, countries in the region. Um, and I think it, at certain times and certain ways and certain campaigns among certain candidates, there was an actual discussion of reform policies uh, that uh, show a greater public interest to engage politicians in those things that people really do want to talk about. Having said all of that, I think the general feeling that one has, uh, and certainly my colleagues uh, at NDI and Toronto have expressed to me, is a sense of separation of the public from the political establishment. The elections and government is essentially the domain of those who occupy political positions. And there are very few entry points for the public at large to express itself in a variety of different ways. Uh, and what, what I think now we're seeing in uh, the Toronto situation uh, extends from the 2009 cycle where the political conflict is, you know, arguably not without some basis of, of, of contested, uh, you know, contested situations. But nevertheless, is, 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 is generated by, occupied by, motivated by uh, partisan political interests and is not really speaking necessarily on behalf of the public as a whole or in the broader interest of where Albania and the Albanian public want to be and where they want to go. One interesting byproduct of all this, if you were to consider this question more statistically, is that we really don't know what the Albanian public thinks. Uh, there is a dearth of credible and impartial public opinion research in Albania that can actually demonstrate whether through polling or focus group research, what the public is actually thinking. How are they responding to this? That would give one a better and clearer sense, not least of, of whom the politicians, about how they can begin to try to respond to what the public wants to engage on. Um, that, is, that is a particular area where, in contrast to other countries in the region, where you do see this type of research coming forward. And uh, I'm happy to say that both uh, my organization, NDI, and our counterparts at the International Republican Institute have, have been able to promote public opinion research, uh, not just in a, in a, let's say, electoral context, but in a public context, so that everyone can understand what the public is thinking. To the question, uh, as I understood it, of, of how this election plays relative to other countries in the region, some countries have got their act a little bit better uh, uh, than others. Uh, there is a, a rather wide disparity in electoral conduct and electoral performance. Um, uh, the, the Toronto mayoral situation uh, aside, I think a lot of the positives and negatives that we've seen in the Albanian uh, local elections are consistent with positives and negatives you see in neighboring countries. And here I'm thinking about Kosovo, I'm thinking about Macedonia. Elections are very dynamic processes. Uh, we, we tend sometimes, I think, to consider them as fixed uh, uh, events. They are obviously very dynamic, not just politically, but institutionally. Even election laws and election systems themselves are dynamic they need to evolve, they need to be refined because society is changing, political expectations, public expectations are, are constantly evolving. And so the degree again to which uh, understanding where we think the Albanian public wants to be, where it is and where it wants the country to go, the political leadership of Albania really must take the initiative to uh, use the institutions available to it, they are there, to uh, to engage each other and the public on election reform. Uh, that, is, that is an essential way to, to move the country forward. Yeah, if, sorry. If I could just add very briefly, and maybe this is the wrong building, but there is uh, increasing public disillusionment with political and parliamentary leaders, not just in, in Albania, but throughout, um, 
throughout countries that, let's say, are in economic distress, they don't see sufficient progress towards European Union entry. Uh, and other than the sectors or uh, uh, the, the people that are tied in with specific political parties, the mass, the mass of the population is not. Um, the mass of the population, its anger is in a way being directed against either the government or the opposition or whoever's in government, whoever's opposition, tries to manipulate, I would say, political um, public distress in, in these circumstances. However, I think it is worth monitoring because social behavior and social responses to uh, economic stagnation, no way out, um, no progress towards European Union, political gridlock, uh, poor living standards, um, few job opportunities and so on and so forth, it won't necessarily be uh, apathy or out-migration. It could also encourage some more extremist movements uh, in Albania, which we certainly do not want to see emerging. So I think Bob is absolutely right. We need to much more closely monitor uh, and engage the public mood and which way it's heading. Th thanks very much, Bob. Yep, thank you. Uh, now, if there's somebody from the audience that would like to uh, ask a question, I think rather than forming a line, I would prefer if people would raise their hand, and I'll try to do it in, uh, in order. Um, and if you could please come up to the uh, podium and uh, first introduce yourself, your name and affiliation, and then if you could just ask a uh, very uh, brief uh, question. And we'll start with uh, Voice of America. Idea Economy with the Voice of America. A question for uh, Mr. Stone Street. Uh, you said, I guess, in uh, one of the interim reports that the legal basis of the decision to count uh, the votes in the wrong boxes was unclear. Is it clear now, uh, that decision to you? I mean, because this is one of the crucial questions that everybody is debating today in Tirana. I mean, it might go beyond this panel, but that's, this is my question. Thanks. Sure. Uh, can I go ahead? Yes, go ahead. Sure. Um, well, yes, we said in our post-election interim report that the uh, the legal basis for what the uh, Central Election doing, uh, Commission was doing uh, in, in opening ballot boxes uh, and, and counting ballots uh, uh, was unclear to us. Um, and, uh, and, of course, uh, the, maybe I should go back and... and that was uh, over one week ago when we uh, issued that um, statement. Uh, at the time, um, uh, the, there was no uh, no decision had been uh, uh, issued. Um, there was a decision in, in principle, um, as, as it's called, but uh, that that's not an official decision. It had no number. It wasn't available on the website. Um, so, in fact. It, it was, um, they were just doing, basically they were doing something with, and then uh, the, the decision to do it would, would come later. Um, and at that point it was very, then very difficult to judge uh, what the legal basis would be because it's the, the decision that has to uh, uh, indicate what the, the legal basis is. And then someone can say the, that the legal basis is clear uh, or, or it's good or it's uh, not sound uh, or whatever. But at that point, there was, there was no um, indication of what the legal basis was. Um, uh, you know, I know that the, the, the decision has been, um, uh, has, has uh, uh, come out. Um, since uh, the time that we issued our interim uh, report, our mission uh, is continuing uh, in Tirana uh, with a reduced uh, uh, presence so that we have uh, two analysts uh, there now. Um, uh, I wouldn't want to comment further on, on the decision itself, as I said, because uh, that's, that's what's uh, actually before uh, the, the uh, Electoral College. So I wouldn't want to speak about um, the decision that was taken after the interim report. Again, we'll come back to that in our final report. Uh, but I just wanted to address why uh, we said that the decision uh, uh, was unclear uh, when we, um, or I'm sorry, that the legal basis for the CEC's actions were unclear uh, when we issued our, our post, uh, uh, post election day interim report. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, now call on uh, 
Jonas Roulette from the Open Society Institute, who is uh, one of the uh, um, best experts, I think, on Albanian affairs here in uh, Washington. Oh, so you. glad to have you here. Uh, thank you, Bob. I was going to try not to make a comment in the form of a question, I, but I, I would actually like to ask uh, Jonathan Stone Street a little bit about um, the issue of the integrity of the ballots as well. So, you know, some of the issues are really muddy. Uh, there are questions of precedent, uh, what has been done in the past with these kinds of ballots uh, and what the proper ruling should be. Um, there are questions, uh, there are holes in the electoral code, there are questions of interpretation, and I think this is a, uh, uh, an area where it's very difficult uh, to say this is right and this is wrong. Um, I, I've been hearing that um, uh, the, the ballot boxes that have been opened um, have revealed discrepancies between the number of voters and the number of votes. Um, as I understand, 117 ballot boxes have been opened. Uh, of those, 98 had discrepancies. 45 of those had more votes than voters, which was uh, a difference of 322. Uh, 53, the remaining 53, had fewer votes than voters, which was a difference of 436. So even if you had ballots inadvertently switched, so somebody put the mayor's ballot in the city council box and put the city council box in the mayoral box, um, you still have, uh, by my math, 114 votes that are unaccounted for. Now, some of this happens in elections. You know, these are not perfect processes by any, uh, by any means. Um, uh, and they're a lot less important when elections aren't as close as these are close. Um, uh, uh, I, I'm interested in hearing a little bit about uh, the OSCE's view of this particular issue, and whether or not you think there are some, uh, some problems here. Um, and I uh, would also maybe ask the ambassador if he would comment on, uh, on this from the government perspective. Yeah, Jonas, if I could just ask you to clarify the discrepancies that you just mentioned, they're specific to Tirana. They're not I'm other. sorry, that's correct, yeah. Okay, yeah. they're not elsewhere. So it revolves around this very close mayoral race. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Uh, Jonathan, would you like to, uh, to uh, start us off? Uh, sure. Um, uh, you know, the, um, when you, actually, it's, uh, maybe it's my, my personal opinion, but uh, it's counting is... Um, uh, something that, that uh, seems like it should be quite uh, uh, easy, but uh, in, in fact, uh, it's, it, it often proves uh, to be uh, to be quite difficult to to, to come to, to what the final uh, answer is. And part of an election is at some point saying uh, this: these are the final numbers. Even though if we reopened everything up and recounted everything, uh, we might come to, to some slightly different numbers, and then that creates a problem when you have. Uh, uh, small, uh, small margins. Um, you know, in the counting uh, process, uh, not only in Tirana but in other places, uh, like I said, the counting did not go uh, perfectly, um, and there m may have been problems in uh, the way uh, numbers were reconciled and put into the uh, results uh, protocols. Uh, there could be uh, miscounts in in some places. Um, one issue is that, um, uh, that while transparency is is very good in many aspects of the the elections uh, in Albania, um, one consequence of having counting centers instead of counting in polling stations uh, is that um, the 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 counting tables are in public view, uh, and then we, we, as the ambassador mentioned, the, the, the ballots are shown on actually on, on camera. Uh, but what's very difficult to see uh, for uh, observers is how the uh, protocols are, are filled out, actually, um, because the, the observers are not allowed to uh, approach the, the, the tables and to see exactly uh, what's what's being uh, done? So it's only the election commission, the, the, the zone election commission members, and the counting team that are actually present uh, at the table. <clears throat> um, but like I said, that's uh, the, the, there can be mistakes that are, are introduced uh, uh, in, into the process in, in, in various ways. Um, I, again, I don't want to talk about uh, these. Uh, uh, the numbers, the, the differences that um, uh, have uh, have been raised, um, I know that um, that there have been differences 
uh, raised. Uh, right now, I'm not um, myself able to say uh, what could be uh, the cause of, of those um, of those differences. Um, another uh, issue that I think that that could be considered uh, in um, in in all of this is uh, it's. Um, also, a question about what to, to count, and um, uh, in this respect, uh, validity uh, or invalidity of ballots, even leaving aside ballots that are uh, in, in the wrong box. Um, there's a very there was I noticed um, uh, in Toronto there there was a very high rate of uh, invalidity of ballots. It was over two uh, percent, and if I remember correctly, approaching three percent. Uh, which is a bit surprising, considering there are three there were three choices to mark on on the ballot. It's um, not not that difficult to get to get right. Um, uh, and this is something that um, uh, again, not necessarily in 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 these elections, but this is something that will have to be uh, con- considered as to to really what makes uh, a, a, a ballot uh, invalid, uh, and to come to some sort of um, uh, Broader consensus uh, uh, about that, um, but I think that that's uh, um, some of these issues are things that, that really need to be looked at in respect um, uh, for future elections, and not not trying to correct them in in the midst of an on, ongoing uh, process. So um, that's basically what I would uh, uh, say without without directly wanting to to, to comment on uh, on the particular. Uh, the, Discrepancies in numbers that were uh, found in uh, in the ballot boxes uh, that were they were opened by the Central uh, Election Commission. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Ambassador Galanchi, uh, Jonas had asked if you could possibly respond as well. Yes, sure. Thank you for making the question because I think and I hope the answer will clarify a lot of things. It appears in the tabulation for the mayoral race, that there are more voters, uh, more ballots than voters. It's only an illusion, because what happened is that the Central Electoral Commission, uh, taking its place as a zonal commission and counting the valid votes which were miscasted in the other box, did not change the tabulation result which came from the zonal commissions. So they simply added numbers that were found valid in these contested votes, let's say, or the votes that were never counted. So it appears that there are more ballot papers in the box for the mayor than the voters. But if you count the total, so let's, let's make a simple arithmetic exercise. You have one voter voting four ballots in four boxes. So practically, you should have 400. Uh, if you have 100 voters, you should have 400 votes in four boxes. What happens is now that you have 110 votes casted in one box and 90 bo- uh, votes in the other box. So it appears that you have more ballot papers in one box. But if you count the total of four boxes, is exactly the same. I know that uh, from the Central Electoral Commission uh, process verbals, there is a discrepancy of one vote only in total in Tirana. So it's one vote that is either more or less. But the rest, so the total numbers are perfect, only that you have this discrepancy. Again, again, I stress here that neither party, I don't want to take sides and I'm not interested in taking sides, but neither party has such soft commissioners that would let me go and vote twice. This is for sure. And in every step of the process, you have a perfect 50-50. In 50, let's say if you have 100 polling stations, in 50 polling stations, you have four commissioners from the position and three commissioners from the opposition. In the other 50, you have the opposite. So it's a perfect balance, I think. And in every step of the process, you have this composition of commissions. So practically, it's impossible for me to go and vote twice or cast two votes because every vote has a counterpart, so which is kept by the commission. So if this is the vote, it's one part of it, and you tear it. The commission takes one part, and you have the other part to vote. So it's impossible, 
practically to happen. And furthermore, there are all, as I said before, there are all legal instruments to solve the issue. Either party that, that contests this has the right to appeal it and to ask a recount of the box in the Central Electoral Commission. If they are not pleased with it, again they have a superior instance, that is the Electoral College. They again can appeal the case and reopen the box if the Electoral College decides to open it and recount. So to make accusations, it's easy. You have to prove them, I think. But furthermore, you have the instruments in place to solve the issue. And as I said, you know, this is the case. You know, you have an exact number in total of voters and ballot papers, but you have this discrepancy because of, the, of this phenomenon that was not foreseen anywhere in the code. And I don't know uh, how many times it will be repeated in the next 100 years that we have a difference of, of less than 100 votes between one and the other. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Am Ambassador. If I could sort of follow up on uh, that point and ask uh, the entire panel um, the question of an institutional question. It seems to me like the Central Election Commission doesn't work very well. We heard uh, Jonathan Stone Street talk about problems when it was first starting up, uh, the fact that uh, they can uh, agree on some things that sort of serve the interests of both political camps. Um, but otherwise, uh, it doesn't seem to uh, work very well. It doesn't have a high degree of, uh, of uh, trust. Um, at the same time, I get the sense that both the political camps in Albania, in fact, have wanted a fairly partisan Central Election Commission. I guess my question is, is it possible for Albania to have a Central Election Commission that is, in fact, less partisan? Um, and whereas we're, we may not be sure what, about the Electoral uh, College and its integrity, but can we say, relatively speaking, uh, the Electoral College is more separate from the politics uh, taking place in Albania um, today than the Central Election Commission is? Um, again, Jonathan, I'll, I'll ask you first if you want to uh, respond to that, and then I'll, I'll go to the other uh, panelists. Uh, thanks. Um, it's a, it's, that's a very uh, interesting question. It's one that uh, I've been uh, thinking about um, myself. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the election commission, I, the, the central election commission, I don't want to give the impression that it's overall uh, working um, uh, badly. Um, we have to keep in mind uh, the, the overall task that they had, which was to organize uh, more than 700 different uh, elections, including printing all of the ballots uh, for, uh, for those elections, um, and doing it within a, a deadlines that are, are actually probably uh, a, a bit short um, uh, in, in, uh, in the election code. Um, and for the most part, they, they, they did a good job on the technical organization uh, of the, the elections. And then where it goes wrong is, uh, as I said, is when the two parties disagree on any issue, um, that's where the, the division starts and the political discussions start. Otherwise, they do take uh, unanimous decisions on, 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 most, uh, on most things. So they, they, the members do have a good um, technical knowledge, and they do know um, how, to, uh, how to, to, to conduct the election process. Um, it's a, it's a separate question of how to, to have the Commission able uh, to resist um, uh, the, the, the political uh, pressures. Um, I, I'm not quite sure yet what the, 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 uh, the answer um, uh, could be. Um, you're correct that the, the two parties uh, wanted um, this uh, situation, and uh, I was even told that, that, that uh, by one of the parties that they wanted a weak uh, uh, commission um, that, that would not have um, uh, basically to be to to um, uh, to act uh, as um, uh, I don't know how to how I should say that as a, as a kind of um, a strong man in the in the process. Um, uh, 
but clearly I think something something uh, has to be done um, to, uh, to 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 strengthen the ability of the commission to to be seen as uh, independent to 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 take um, independent uh, um, decisions so I don't know whether that means adding um, uh, an element of uh, of a nonpartisan um, uh, uh, Person or persons in in the commission, uh, or or some other uh, mechanism, um, it, it, the, I think that's that's still uh, an open question. Um, but clearly, there 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 uh, there is an issue there. Um, and again, it's also the, the the parties put a tremendous amount of pressure uh, on the commission itself uh, instead of stepping back and, and letting the uh, election commission do its job. Uh, they they are uh, interfering. Um, they you know they have the right to speak at uh, the election commission uh, meetings, and, and sometimes it, it becomes a kind of uh, mini parliament or uh, or TV talk show where uh, there's a political discussion going on that's um, completely apart from uh, the the actual election commission members. There's just a discussion between. Uh, party representatives. Um, so uh, certainly something will um, uh, need to be considered uh, in that regard in, in, in terms of strengthening uh, the, the commission and in strengthening um, uh, the, 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 the confidence um, in, its, in the impartiality of its decisions. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Uh, Rob Benjamin? Thank you, Bob. Uh, I think it's – well, you asked if, if, if it's possible that the Central Election Commission can be independent in Albania, and my answer is, of course it's possible. Uh, but I think we have to set the right expectation. No, no governing body, whether it's the Central Election Commission, whether it's Parliament, is immune from partisan politics. I mean, that's as true in a transitioning country to democracy as it is in an established democracy. We are in, in the U.S. Congress. Uh, let it not be forgot it, forgotten. Uh, but by the same token, I think one of the challenges that transitioning countries have is to build integrity into those political institutions. And what do I mean by integrity? I mean that, that those institutions have to accommodate uh, partisan agendas in a manner that allows the institution itself to be... Uh, to have credibility as an independent institution. So the parties nominate members to the Central Election Commission. That's the law. They do it, and those individuals take their seats. And yes, part of the job of those individuals, arguably, or those who would advise them, perhaps more properly, is to look at uh, election procedure from a party angle. But fundamentally, and by law, the members and the commissioners uh, of the Central Election uh, Commission are there to administer the elections according to law. Uh, and that's, I think, the challenge that uh, Albania has in developing uh, these uh, institutions, institutionalizing democracy. Again, not to uh, 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 neuter it uh, or make it somehow immune from politics. That's really not the expectation but to accommodate such that the institution at the end of the day can stand before the public and, said, and say we did institutionally uh, what we could do to uphold the law. Um, and I think that's really the challenge going forward. And again, I want to put that challenge in the context of a very broad, long-term, and comprehensive transition process that Albania has experienced and will continue to experience. Um, I wanted just to offer one thought uh, on the question over misplaced ballots, if I could as well. I, this is a very complicated area. As Jonathan said, ballot, <laughs> counting ballots seems to be a very straightforward process, and oftentimes it is anything, anything but. Um, I, I, it, it's my understanding that the law does not specify a process by which to consider ballots that are miscast into the wrong box. Uh, and, and, and 
understandable error, I think, on a part of, of, of voters who are trying to maneuver themselves through what is typically a crowded polling station, and you have different ballots and different boxes. I mean, that's, that's an understandable thing to have happen. Because there's no legal, as I understand it anyway, no, no legal basis in which on how to consider those ballots, um, what you find, as I understand from my colleagues in Tirana, is that different commissions will do different things with those ballots. One of the questions, probably, uh, is trying to figure out um, among the universe of, of miscast ballots which were considered uh, contested and which were considered invalid. And I think that's probably an area of consideration that needs deliberation and some movement on so that if miscast ballots are to be incorporated, um, it's my personal view uh, they should be, that it's done on a consistent basis, it's done on a procedural basis, and it is done to the, to the extent possible on a consensus-based uh, approach. Um, and let's hope that if, if, if that is the path forward, whether marked by individual commissions as contested or invalid, this cast ballots will be treated in, in the same manner as much as possible. Okay, thank you. Janusz, would you? Okay. Okay. Uh, the next question from uh, the audience. Somebody would like to raise their hand, ask a question? Well, I can ask one more question and uh, give people a little more time to think of one. I uh, hope that we'd have more questions from the, uh, the audience. Um, we had heard uh, comments about the domestic election observers, and I was wondering, uh, I haven't heard anything about what conclusions they may have drawn thus far. Is there any reporting on that? Um, I might ask uh, Rob Benjamin first if he knows anything about that, and then Jonathan, if you could uh, elaborate. <coughs> Uh, as I said before, uh, I think it's, it's a testament to the, the will of Albanians to want to be involved in the political process to see uh, the advancement of nonpartisan uh, election monitoring. Uh, I think that uh, this is a critical aspect to uh, the health of an election process. It is, it is vitally important that the international community uh, participate as accredited observers uh, in uh, the election processes around the Western Balkans, as is the case elsewhere in, in wider Europe. Um, and I think uh, in many cases it's appropriate that um, people look to the internationals, uh, the OSCEs or the NDI delegations, etc., for a rendering or some assessment of how uh, how uh, the process has unfolded and the degree to which that process has, has met uh, international democratic standards. Democratic elections uh, belong to the people of the country uh, in which they are taking place. So fundamentally, it makes sense that uh, citizens who are duly trained to be in polling stations and at vote counting centers be able to exercise on a collective and, and methodologically sound uh, 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 basis and assessment of the conduct of those elections. It's, it's very important that citizens in Albania be able to turn to their own to have a non-partial, excuse me, an impartial assessment of the election. So all of that is to the good. We were able in the 1990s to seed and see the first uh, uh, beginnings of nonpartisan domestic election monitoring. Uh, I'm happy to say that Jonas Rolette uh, of OSI formerly was with NDI and was our first representative in Tirana now almost 20 years ago, and uh, among other things, uh, helped to plant this idea um, among Albanian civic groups. And it's, it's, it, we've seen it at, at NDI, NDI take shape and form around the region, and now there's a network of domestic election observer groups that are sharing their experiences farther afield. Uh, in Eurasia and soon to be in North Africa and elsewhere. That's all to the good. Albania lacks, at this point, a sufficient amount of civic voices to participate in the political process. So the voice that this group of domestic observers exercises is for that reason in particular extremely important. 
They did issue a post-election report similar to the OSCE's interim report after uh, the elections, in term, similar in terms of timing, and they offered their findings. And I do hope that through the media and through other media, their findings uh, are able to um, uh, reach the Albanian public. Um, as, in as much as they offer a domestic perspective on the issues that we're discussing, and a platform, therefore, for the Albanian public to have amongst themselves a discussion on how best uh, to understand this process and to move forward. What we don't want to see is a, if you will, a, a, a wholesale deference to the international community to, to essentially say, well, international community, tell us what we should be thinking. Um, uh, there is a role for the international community to play as assessors, as conveners, but the success to which a country is able to move toward democracy is largely determined on the ability of its own institutions to process uh, these political uh, events, and in particular, the conflicts that naturally arise from these events. And that's really, I think, what we're trying to look at right now uh, in Albania. So whether it's the independence of the CEC or the presence, the vitality, and the integrity of domestic election observers, those are all very important. Uh, or, obviously, as we've also discussed, the ability of the political parties to acquit themselves in a proper manner. Um, these are all indications as to whether or not Albania is reaching the point where, on its own steam, it can handle uh, these sometimes very difficult issues. Okay, Jonathan, uh, would you like to elaborate on the domestic observers and any comments that they had made on the quality of these elections? Um, well, I, actually, I think Rob said it uh, quite quite well. Um, uh, I mean, they have the domestic observers, uh, they're different uh, groups. Um, I think it's, uh, of course, important to look at um, uh, the methodology that the, the different groups are, are using, and are they... Uh, you know how are they observing elections and uh, reaching conclusions? It's uh, there's some groups that um, uh, seem to be uh, perhaps uh, uh, not as nonpartisan as as some of the other ones. Um, uh, but the the main coalition of uh, domestic observers uh, seem to do um, a very credible, um, a very credible. Uh, job, and I think it's exactly what um, uh, Rob was uh, was saying. Um, it, their uh, their conclusions need to be uh, fed into an eventual electoral um, reform process. And electoral reform, it's uh, as the ambassador said, it's um, uh, something that it's actually very much agreed on by um, uh, both the. the, the ruling uh, parties and, and opposition parties um, as something that needs to take place. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the, uh, the, the findings and conclusions and recommendations of domestic observers uh, should, should form a greater part of that discussion than, than perhaps they did, uh, than perhaps has been the case uh, in, in the past. Uh, the previous electoral reform was largely the product of, of the two main parties uh, um, uh, reaching uh, uh, agreement, um, and and perhaps the, the next round should not only include that, but uh, um, should include uh, other um, others feeding into the processes as well, uh, including the um, the views of, uh, of the Central uh, Election Commission, um, but also the, the domestic. Um, uh, observers, um, but I think it is uh, important that um, uh, that Albanian uh, voices uh, are are uh, listened to, um, and uh, not only the international community's uh, um, uh, uh, word as as being the final uh, determining factor. Okay, thank you. Uh, Avni Mustafai from the National Albanian American Council. Uh, thank you, Bob. <clears throat> thank you, Bob. Uh, Avni Mustafai with the National Albanian American Council. Uh, based on the presentations, we understand that the voting process uh, went well, and that the issue now is really with the counting of the of uh, of these boxes of these votes 
that were put into the wrong box. What we're understanding is that there seems to be no clarity in the elections law for resolving that issue. At some point, this process is going to end, and the Electoral College, which we understand is sort of the Supreme Court of this process, will have to make a decision. So my question is for Mr. Stone Street. Once that decision is made, is the OSCE then going to abide by that, that decision that the, uh, that, the, that, the, uh, that the court comes up with? Jonathan? Um, well, we don't uh, intervene in the, 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 the process, uh, so it's, uh, it's not us for us to abide by uh, a decision that they take. Uh, the question is uh, for the, the participants, uh, uh, the contestants in the, in the process. Um, we will issue a final report um, based on the entire uh, election process, um, but that will uh, you know, start with uh, everything that we, we looked at at the beginning of the process, uh, starting back with uh, candidate registration and, and uh, voters' lists, uh, up through the, the campaign uh, and election day, um, but then also considering the uh, post-election uh, complaints and, and appeals uh, process. Um, and I think it's also important to, to keep in mind that um, because there were uh, 384 other uh, or 383 other uh, local government units that were, that were holding elections, uh, there are a lot of uh, complaints and, and appeals um, so the Central Election Commission and the Electoral College will have to deal with um, uh, a number of other issues uh, in, uh, in addition to, uh, to the mayor's race of, of Tirana. Uh, and I don't think it's fair to judge the entire election process by uh, what happens with the, 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 the mayor's race of, for, for Tirana. Um, I also would like to caution against uh, you know, we said that the, the election day process went relatively well, um, and maybe I should go into a little bit more uh, detail on that. Um, our observers found that 90% uh, of uh, the polling stations visited, they, they assessed as being good or, or very good. And that means in 10% that it was um, assessed negatively. Now, uh, that's actually quite a... Um, um, a significant number, uh, 10%, uh, to be assessed in that way. And again, these were mostly procedural uh, difficulties. Um, but the point I wanted to make is that um, uh, regardless of what happens with uh, complaints and appeals, uh, that this process of, 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 of conducting the voting and, and uh, the counting, uh, it's still it's going to need um, uh, some some work. It's. Uh, uh, I, I don't think that we can say that everything was uh, uh, was was uh, perfect or um, that it that it fully met uh, um, uh, the the uh, international standards. Um, these are there's some issues that are going to be need to be looked at more, uh, including, for example, the late uh, appointment of voting commission members and counting team members uh, that in some cases uh, led to these people uh, being trained only hours before they were starting uh, or not being trained at all by uh, uh, not being officially trained at all. Um, so I think that there, there are still going to be uh, some issues that, that need to be looked at and we shouldn't op oversimplify um, either in a positive or negative uh, direction, but look at the different um, elements of the process uh, in, in looking, looking at the positives uh, and, and moving forward from those, um, but also looking carefully at, at what didn't go well uh, and, or, or didn't go as well as it, as it, as it could have uh, and, and finding ways to address those uh, in, in, in the future. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. If I could ask uh, uh, Janusz Bugajski um, a question, um, sort of going to the more broader uh, picture. Um, Albania is a, uh, a NATO ally, and um, as somebody who participated here in the U.S. Congress in some of the discussions on NATO enlargement generally, but specifically with the last round, um, my own personal conclusion, I can't really speak for the, the members I work for on this issue, is that there's in principle no country that actually deserves NATO membership more than Albania in the sense of 
their desire to join. Um, if you look at Albanian history and um, all the country has gone through and what is now almost 100 years of statehood, I believe it's next year will be the, the century mark for uh, the Albanian, Albania as a country. Um, but we, we did ask uh, the question at the time. Well, I would also point out that probably there's no one question where there's a more democratic answer in Albania than on whether they want to join NATO. I mean, I think there's a lot of consensus on that as well. Uh, so it would have been hard to, uh, to argue against it. Um, but the question that we did ask was, by letting Albania into uh, NATO, did we lose leverage on um, a country that was still going through uh, uh, political transformation? Um, at the time, this was actually asked to uh, Assistant Secretary of State uh, for European Affairs, Dan Freed, um, uh, in Senate hearings on uh, the subject. And he expressed some optimism, um, pointing out that uh, uh, countries who join NATO have a tendency to continue to reform, in fact, uh, strengthen their reform um, as they are in um, as they join the NATO alliance and uh, become integrated into it. I was wondering if you could sort of do a, an assessment. Um, uh, have we lost our leverage with Albania um, when we try to press some of these points for uh, further progress in uh, political uh, reform? And you had also mentioned uh, briefly some ways that uh, it actually affects um, the alliance, crime and corruption, if there's a place where there's a lack of rule of law, despite the very pro-American, pro-NATO sentiment of Albania, it means that some things that could be contrary to the national security of Albania or the alliance uh, um, uh, could take place. Um, and also uh, where there's a um, lack of respect for democratic institutions, where they're not strong enough, there can also be uh, instabilities that lead uh, other forces perhaps to become... Uh, uh, more potent in the country than they otherwise would be. So if you could maybe elaborate a little bit on your assessment of, uh, of uh, Albania post-NATO membership. Um, has it, in fact, improved in any ways? Um, is there reason to regret the decision? And uh, how can we uh, continue to have leverage on Albania to have it move forward uh, beyond the EU enlargement process, which, as you pointed out, a lot of countries have become somewhat disillusioned with that uh, based on pronouncements from Brussels. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, no, I don't think there should be any regrets of getting Albania into NATO. I think it was the right decision at the right time. Uh, remember, Albania was, the, as far as I remember, the first country in the region to ask for NATO membership, and they're still trying to find the one person who opposed. I mean, you, the uh, public opinion was overwhelming before. Albania has also um, contributed within, obviously, its limited capabilities in, uh, to NATO missions, uh, such as Afghanistan and elsewhere. Uh, it, it's, it's actually proved to be, looking at the regional context, a very stable regional player. Uh, none of the governments, whether Democrat or, or Socialist, have taken aboard anything resembling a, a pan-Albanian uh, agenda. Uh, in fact, they've studiously avoided uh, giving any kind of impression, uh, unlike some governments in the region, that they harbor any pretensions to neighboring territories, to neighboring countries. Uh, and they've actually gone along both with EU and US policy in the region very studiously, I would say, in terms of, st in terms of stability, maintaining, um, let's say, not provoking um, uh, forces that could further destabilize parts of the region. In terms of domestic politics, I think the EU, actually, the EU membership question is a much more effective uh, soft power lever that the EU seems to be losing in terms of, of reform. I mean, NATO does require certain reforms in civil military relations, you know, armed forces, uh, structure, interoperability, and so forth, which Albania has done, uh, given its limited resources, but nevertheless has and is committed to. Um, but it's all the other things that we've talked about here, you know, some of the institutional reform, legal reform, uh, including, uh, of course, uh, judicial reform, which has been very difficult for other NATO, new NATO members. You look at Bulgaria and Romania, 
who came in just uh, a few years ago and the problems and criticisms that they've come under. So I would say the EU, um, the prospect of EU membership is a much more effective and specific uh, set of conditions for Albania. I don't think, the last point I want to make, I don't think we've lost um, influence at all with Tehran, any government in Tehran. I think the pro-American feeling is so strong I don't think any Albanian government would want to do anything that's at completely out of sync with what America would want. In other words, the question is how to uh, align Albanian and American national interests so that both benefit each other. And I think it is in Albania's national interest, obviously, to have a stable government that's making progress in its reforms. Unfortunately, we've witnessed this paralysis, and I'm thinking of ways in which the U.S. can assist uh, the EU in, 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 in sort of moving beyond this blockage and getting Albania back on track. Okay, thank you. Is there another question from the audience? If not, I know that my colleague Mark has a, uh, another question to ask. Um, if somebody does, uh, they can come up to the podium, I think, at, while Mark is asking his question. Mark? Thanks, Bob. I have a question for for Janusz. Uh, we've been we've been mostly talking about about um, sort of empirical political phenomena today, the kind of things that can be studied by uh, political scientists. I'd like to ask a different kind of question, one people probably didn't come here uh, today pre prepared to talk about. So I, I I understand if you if you would you would rather not answer this one, but uh, I'd, I'd like to ask about some of the things that are going going on, as far as we can tell deeper beneath the, 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 uh, the, the, the surface in Albania. This is a country that's been through a lot, uh, an awful lot. Was, was, you know, for, for 40 years, it was one of the most brutally persecuted. The people uh, of Albania were one of the most brutally persecuted people in the world. 20 years now of democracy. It, it, it's a Muslim country in, 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 in Central Europe. A lot of fascinating things go, going on there. Um, difficult for uh, us often to understand how all these things come together. What do you think is, is going on w with, with the Albanians as they assess their ride of the past, of the past 20 years, their, 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 their um, new career as a democratic country, uh, their relations to... Um, Particularly the United States, uh, I, I think any any country entering into the the democratic experiment, you always tend to judge that and relate that to the countries that model democracy. And and for for good or ill, America is is the is is the, is the symbol of of, of the of, of the democratic model today. Um, how, how do Albanians? Think about this. Does it seem to them to have been an overwhelming success? Is it seen as the only alternative? Are there are there people proposing other alternatives? Are are they insignificant numerically or or not? Any, any thoughts you may have in this direction would be very interesting to me. Sure. Um, Sorry, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, it's it's a good question, but it's such a broad question. It, it's difficult to know where to come to grips with it. But I would say in general terms, and from my experience of dealing with, with population in Albania for over 20 years, that they see themselves really as part of the West. Um, this sort of Muslim label that they have, they, they're Muslim by religion, but they're certainly not uh, radicals in any sense, and it's not an anti-Western Islam. It's actually a great opportunity. It's, <laughs> Pork and they drink alcohol. You know, it's it's a, it's a it's actually a great opportunity for incorporating Albania to show how tolerant and multicultural Europe is, um, and that it can swallow, if you like, European Union, a nominally predominantly Muslim country, uh, with, with without undermining its values. Uh, the other part of it, I think, Albania is very much pro-Western. There's always been a suspicion and not just in Albania, but in other parts of the region, particularly amongst the Albanian population, that the European Union itself, while a good destination, is very much disunited in terms of policy, in terms of commitment, uh, in terms of its uh, position and attitude towards these new emerging countries, whereas the United States seems to be more consistent in trying to, um, trying to make sure that these countries become fully members of the Western community, all the Western institutions. So, you know, if, if you dig deep down, I don't think that commitment's gone. I think the frustration is, 
is I think it's mounting vis-a-vis -vis all politicians in the country, and that's not just in Albania, but may become even more so as a result of these elections. There is, I think, frustration that we could, we should be moving faster towards the European Union, that partisan interests may be holding the population back uh, from from what they can achieve. There's, I think, some frustration. I mean, I know in the past, and since the visa um, uh, liberalization has come into the European Union, things have got a little bit easier, but there was some resentment before that some parts of the West, Western Europe see as a, a second-class citizens, which is actually quite ironic because any Albanian I know that's moved to the West does extremely well for themselves <laughs> economically. Uh, and clearly, they're a very, very hard-working, productive population, but the conditions in Albania still aren't what they should be to make the most out of the the, let's say, the, the potential of the citizenry. Uh, and I think that could breed increasing frustration throughout migration, through protest uh, that could be channeled in quite dangerous directions. Thank you, Janis. Of course, I'd love to hear from, from uh, Jonathan and, and, and Rob on this as well, if, if you have something to, to say. I, I, I understand it's a little bit more off your, your uh, brief here professionally, but, but I, I'd, I'd love to hear your comments. Jonathan, do you have any comment? Um, no, I think I'll stick to uh, uh, to. Uh... Okay, uh, Rob, do you have a comment or? No, I. Um... Okay. Ambassador, very very brief comment. Very brief. Okay. I promise I'll be very brief. Very, very is my favorite word. <laughs> Good. Uh... <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> I'm an OSCE product. <laughs> So I would characterize the general public opinion of Albanians as simply impatient. They are impatient to reach the final destination that is EU membership because of different reasons. I could bring you only uh, one example. So if Macedonia had, let's say, 100 kilometers of highway in 1990, Albania had zero. If Croatia had 100 touristic hotels in 1990, Albania had only one, controlled by the Communist Party. Okay. If all the region had the right of property, Albanians were prohibited the right of property by law. If the whole world believed in God and had religion, Albania was prohibited, or Albanians were prohibited by law the right of, of exercising their religion since 1967. So if you take into, into consideration all these factors and you see how far has Albania moved from point zero 1999 and compare it with the rest of the region, you'll make the difference yourself. That is fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think uh, to wrap up our um, discussion today, um, what we often do with these briefings is allow the panelists to make one brief, uh, or very, very brief, to use my uh, favorite word, uh, concluding remark, uh, maybe a one-minute remark. And uh, let's do it in uh, reverse order. We'll start with Janos, and then uh, Rob, and then uh, Jonathan. Then I'll make a couple of comments and then turn it back uh, to Mark uh, to adjourn the, the briefing. Janos? Okay, extremely brief. That's another good word. Uh, Albania is a democracy, I would say, but democracy is a very broad concept. And, and I think at times like this, uh, like the battle over the ballots, uh, over the local elections, it does exhibit signs that it is sometimes not a fully functioning democracy. So the question is how to get Albania on track that it can pass legislation, that it can uh, satisfy the public, who are after all the citizens and the voters, that it that can create a sufficient level of coexistence between the two major political forces. Let's face it, you're not going to change the system overnight. That things can go ahead in terms of reform, in terms of the country's progress towards the European Union. And that is, I think, the, the sort of basic question that, that we all confront. Thank you. Uh, Rob Benjamin? Albania is uh, making its way through a comprehensive and long-term transition process. Uh, the degree to which its political institutions can function both in terms of incorporating partisan politics and then uh, coming up over them to ensure uh, that those institutions are serving the interests of the Albanian public 
that really is a mark of a functioning democracy. And I think this election process, similar to the previous elections, is a, is a, is a, is a moment in which we can uh, all of us look at these questions. Fundamentally, the answers have to come from uh, both uh, from within Albania. The political parties have their obligations. Both uh, uh, main political parties uh, are, are, have to <laughs> live with each other, uh, and they need to show the public that they can get down to work and, and get things agreed to and get the job done. And as they do that, they have to create room for other voices. Uh, the political parties need to, uh, political party leadership need to accommodate different and even dissenting voices within their own parties, and they need to allow in civic voices, people that uh, want to say other things and contribute to the political fabric of the country. That fundamentally will get Albania to where it needs to be in terms of building these political uh, institutions that are democratic. Thank you, Rob. Jonathan, are you still there? No, I, I had heard we lost him. I think he took uh, my very, very brief to your extremely brief to being. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, let me just say in, uh, in conclusion um, that um, I think a big day will be on Friday, see what the Electoral College will uh, have to say. Hopefully uh, their decision will be a wise one, a clear one. Um, and hopefully it's one that, um, in accordance with uh, Albanian laws, is one that uh, people will respect as, uh, as the decision that has been made, whether they like it or not, uh, and that uh, both parties, uh, whether they win or lose, will, uh, will accept that decision, um, that there won't be recourse to the streets, protest, violence, et cetera. Um, so uh, let's uh, keep our fingers crossed and hope that um, that uh, the outstanding issues of this election um, get resolved and that Albania comes out of this a better country as a uh, as a result. Um, in some ways, I think maybe I may still be one of the more critical um, uh, people uh, speaking at this briefing uh, regarding uh, Albania um, today because we do continue, in fact, to speak about, uh, issues like violence and being happy when, uh, violence has been kept to a minimum, et cetera. Um, I think that I'll stop having briefings on Albania when we no longer even have to mention the word, uh, violence or street protests, um, that it's a foregone conclusion that things go through a legal process, um, and that we don't have to worry about those, uh, things. Um, similarly, we may be able to perfect uh, the way to count the ballots, which is one of the more difficult things for uh, um, election officials in Albania to do. Um, it's done through um, a centralized uh, counting process. Um, even if through all the videoing of the ballots and things to ensure that it goes right, um, even if there's a perfect way to do that so that there's no question what the result is, um, centralized counting and such extreme scrutiny, um, while good, should in part be a preference, not a necessity. The very fact that Albania cannot have um, counting at polling stations, if it chooses, like many other countries do, indicates that there's still a long way to go in the political culture, the civic culture in Albania um, in terms of how things operate. And I think for that reason, I'll probably be having more uh, briefings as well. In addition to what the ambassador had, uh, had mentioned um, about his in inability to vote because he's here, I think I'm on record, at least in Voice of America interviews, going back to 2005 or before, saying that um, given the number of Albanian citizens that live abroad, it's a shame that they're disenfranchised, they're not allowed to vote unless they go back to uh, Albania to do so. We know that um, the electoral uh, process in Albania can't handle outside voting at this moment, first things first. Um, but um, I believe that um, Albania, like other countries, should be able to do that for the sake of its citizens, and it's something that will encourage... Um, encourage uh, the country to move uh, to move toward. Um, and so I think my concluding uh, remark is that um, 
uh, as somebody who's maybe not the most powerful friend of Albanian Washington, but one of the longest friends of Albanian Washington, I really want to see it move forward. I want to see it progress. I am very glad that it's a NATO member, and that's perhaps because of some of the criticisms we gave early on that led to reform. And I hope that these criticisms that uh, have been given today um, about the May 8th elections and the overall political atmosphere are taken into account by all political leaders um, in uh, Albania, opposition and, um, and in government alike, um, and that they, they think seriously about how they can move the country uh, forward. Uh, just one final quick remark as somebody who's organized uh, this briefing, I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Ambassador Cynthia Eford uh, for her, her help. Um, uh, the ambassador is on loan to the commission from uh, the State Department, and we're appreciative of the State Department for loaning us uh, senior foreign service officers to advise us and us. And I want to thank uh, the ambassador in particular for helping trying to make uh, everything we have here today um, work out as well as it did. Thank you. Mark? Well, on behalf of Chairman Smith, I'd like to thank the briefers, uh, Ambassador Galanji, uh, Bob Hand for his work, his work on this, Josh Shapiro for his work on this, and all of you for coming. We're adjourned. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.